violent murder of 15 year old Kristen Gray extinguished a young life filled with dreams and hopes of a promising future. In an instant of rage, a killer had left Kristen's mother, Patty, to face life alone without the love and companionship of her daughter. I'm Brian Dennehy, and this is Arrest and Trial. From the day her daughter was born, Patty Gray and Kristen shared a uniquely close bond. Ever since she was a baby, we were very close. She was very outgoing, bubbly. She loved people. There was an immediate bonding with me that here I finally had an unconditional love that nobody could take away from me. Unfortunately, someone did. Laura Hyde and Al Collier of the San Diego Sheriff's Department Homicide Division were assigned to the Kristen Gray murder investigation. Her case was, a, was an unusual case. It was a high profile case. She was a young girl. She should not have been murdered. It was a very emotional case for us to work. When detectives arrived at the crime scene, they thoroughly searched the exterior of Kristen's mobile home. They found no evidence of forced entry. According to Patty Gray, she had left a key under a fake rock out in the front porch, and the key was missing. We don't know if a suspect used that key to gain entrance or if the door was unlocked and he just walked in. But we know there was no sign of forced entry. The attack took place in her bedroom, and our victim, Kristen, had been stabbed numerous times in the chest and the back. She had several defensive wounds on her arms, which uh, show us that she put up a, a terrific struggle. Investigators also found signs of a sexual assault. The most important thing that was left at the crime scene was semen on Kristen's body, which was dna -able. Once we found the person that did this, there was no way that they could deny being responsible. There was a hair, a dark brown curly hair that was collected during the scene processing. So we had a description of the suspect's hair color. Near Kristen's body were several homework papers spattered with blood. There were also several bloody thumbprints. After they gathered the evidence, police concentrated on pinpointing the time frame of the attack. What we know that happened to Kristen is that she was on the telephone with her boyfriend. Uh, she ended the conversation at 9 o'clock. Her mother returned home at approximately 9.20 and found Kristen in her bedroom. So within a 20-minute window, someone had entered that uh, residence, sexually assaulted her, and killed her. We knew it had to be a person that had some kind of acquaintance with Kristen, someone who knew her, uh, felt comfortable enough around her to go to her house within this small time frame. Detectives interviewed Kristen's neighbors. They theorized that the narrow time frame of the crime, coupled with the missing key, meant that the killer lived nearby and had been watching the Gray household. For the majority of people that we contacted, we asked them, would you mind giving us a blood sample or a saliva sample? And we sent it out for DNA analysis and compared it against what we had. None of the samples taken matched the DNA recovered from the crime scene. Police then turned to Kristen's high school acquaintances, but the more they learned about the popular teenager, the more they discovered that her life was the picture of innocence. Kristen was a 15-year-old girl. She was a junior varsity cheerleader uh, at age 15. She was uh, a devout Christian. She uh, attended church regularly. She had very high morals, uh, did not believe in premarital sex. Uh, didn't party, you know, she was a good, good kid. She loved people, she loved animals. She, she had a kind heart, a loving heart. She loved to laugh. She had a contagious laugh. Investigators continued to interview potential suspects, but they were running out of leads. And as the weeks turned into months, the likelihood of catching Kristen's killer grew dimmer and dimmer. But Patty Gray refused to give up hope and appealed directly to the public. The police say that they're continuing the investigation and following up on leads. 
And I want to plead to please come forward and turn yourself in. It'll make it so much easier on you. Memorials on the anniversary of Kristen's death focused attention on the case. Fundraisers were held to raise reward money, but nothing seemed to help. After two years, nothing happened. So I took that money and I turned it into a scholarship fund. A broken-hearted Patty Gray moved away from the trailer park, still clinging to the hope that someday the killer would be found. But four and a half years had passed since Kristen's murder. 80 people had been interviewed and their DNA tested. All were cleared. The case faded from public memory and vanished into the ever-growing file of unsolved murders. At times, I probably thought that the, the homicide would not be solved, but when you get those thoughts, you have to push them out of your mind and continue to go, um, go on with the investigation. An innocent young woman who only offered joy and love to those around her had been sadistically robbed of her life. But Kristen Gray would not be forgotten, and investigators vowed to bring her killer to justice. For more than four years, the savage murder of 15-year-old Kristen Gray haunted her mother and everyone who had been assigned to the unsolved case. For more than four years, the savage murder of 15-year-old Kristen Gray haunted her mother and everyone who had been assigned to the unsolved case. But then a 911 report of a peeping Tom would bring investigators back to the same trailer park where Kristen had been killed evoke an eerie sense of deja vu. On April 16, 1996, four years after Kristen's murder, a resident at the trailer park witnessed a strange occurrence. A neighbor looked out her window at about 10 p.m. that evening and saw a guy looking into a bedroom window in the trailer where Kristen Gray had been murdered in. Ironically, there was a 17-year-old girl that lived in that bedroom and she bore a strong resemblance to Kristen Gray. Hello, police. The neighbor immediately called police. She recognized the peeping Tom as Kevin Fitch, a 39-year-old electronics technician and longtime resident of the trailer park. Based on what she told us, we were able to obtain a search warrant to search his mobile home for any evidence. I'm Detective Collier, this is Detective Helig. We have a warrant to search your premises. I can't tell you how many times we had been to the trailer park and asked people, who do you think could have done this? And nobody ever mentioned Kevin, because Kevin was basically a non-entity. He was a loner. He was there, but people just didn't see him. He was very strange. He was too accommodating. Well, sure, come on in. He wanted to basically tell us what a loser he was from the get-go. He was happy to have someone to talk to. It's like he had been cooped up alone all these years, and because he was getting a little bit of attention, he just loved it. I came home after work, and uh, I sat here, and I had a beer, and I watched TV like I normally do. Fitch denied he had been spying on the neighbor girl, and although he admitted to knowing Kristen Gray, he adamantly stated that he knew nothing about her murder. After interviewing Fitch, detectives searched his trailer. He had an abundance of uh, videos and magazines. A lot of them were in reference to young girls. They were girls that were obviously over 18, but dressed to look like teenagers. Then, detectives discovered paperwork that Fitch had been saving for over four years. It was the crucial clue they had been hoping for. What was the date of the murder? April 9th, 1992. And he said, well, look at this. Here's a, a receipt from the Industrial Medical Center uh, and a workman's comp claim dated April 10th, 1992. And it shows that he went in and had sutures on the inside palm of his right hand that morning. We knew immediately that, that he was our, our suspect. Fitch's blood was drawn and sent out for DNA analysis, but it would take weeks for the test results to come back.
In the meantime, Fitch was put under 24-hour surveillance. For the next seven days, the suspect played a strange game of cat and mouse with police. He loved being uh, put under surveillance. And this wasn't a covert surveillance. We didn't care if he knew. He uh, relished in the idea that he actually had these officers following him around 24 hours of the day. He even told all his co-workers, I'm the number one suspect. He loved being the center of attention. But Kevin Fitch was about to get far more attention than he could have ever hoped for. Tests confirmed that DNA samples recovered from Kristen's body and the blood on her homework papers came from Kevin Fitch. Kevin Fitch? You're under arrest. Kevin Fitch was arrested and charged with murder during the commission of a rape. Forensic evidence. We found your hair in the trail. Well, can you tell us how that happened. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that it's awful windy where we live there, and the wind must have just blew it in. I said, Kevin, you're like the little child who has eaten the candy bar and has chocolate all over their mouth, and yet keeps saying, "I didn't eat the candy bar." And his face filled up, his uh, eyes became teary. He backed his chair as far in the corner as he could, he crossed his arm and said, maybe I need to talk to an attorney. And at that point, the interview was over. After four years, I think he was convinced that we would never catch him. And even when we did catch him, I think he was convinced that we would never convict him. And he would be the second O.J. Simpson, and he would get off. Four years had passed since Kristen Gray's life was cut short. Her neighbor, Kevin Fitch, was linked to the bloody killing. It was now up to prosecutors to finally close the book on the tragic murder and give Kristen's mother the closure she had longed for. For veteran deputy district attorney, Catherine Stevenson, there was no escaping the emotional impact of Kristen Gray's murder. Many times I was brought to tears by thinking about what had happened to her. She was a totally innocent uh, victim. And I think it uh, left all of us who were involved in the case uh, a little sadder that we had lost her. The prosecution was determined to make Kevin Fitch pay the ultimate price for his heartless crime. But in order to secure a death sentence, they would have to prove both premeditated murder and torture. Catherine Stevenson began with the DNA evidence collected at the crime scene. First, DNA blood samples found on an essay. Her blood, his blood, and his fingerprint. Next, Stevenson introduced Fitch's workers' compensation claim to corroborate that he had been injured around the time of Kristen's murder. Hair and other physical evidence found at the scene were identified as belonging to Fitch. Catherine Stevenson then concentrated on proving that Kevin Fitch deliberately made Kristen Gray suffer. Kevin Fitch knew when Kristen was going to be alone. He could see her trailer from his trailer and could easily have known that Mrs. Gray regularly left on a Thursday night. He entered the trailer, armed with a knife, and raped Kristen. She had many, many stab wounds to her body, but she also had many small prick marks to her face and to her arms and to her chest. And really, the only explanation for those injuries would have been to inflict pain on this little girl before she died. Finally, fighting back years of grief, Patty Gray took the stand and described how she found the body of her only child. Her head moved and that her neck had been cut very deeply. 
on both sides, one much longer and deeper than the other. The defense countered that Kevin Fitch was far from being a perverted killer. Several family members and co-workers testified that he was a kind, considerate, quiet man who never hurt anyone. I, I could not conceive such, such an act from, from uh, the young man. The prosecution and defense in the Kevin Fitch murder trial rested their cases. The defendant was led out of the courtroom and the waiting began. quickly moved to retry the penalty phase. He killed my daughter, and he deserved, in my mind, to get the same thing. I believe in an eye for an eye. I feel that he should be raped, that he should be stabbed and left to bleed to death as he left my daughter to bleed to death. But I know that that can't happen. Every time I had to get up on that witness stand, every day I had to go in that courtroom, I was reliving that night, and it was a nightmare. Patty Gray asked the prosecution to stop seeking the death penalty. On October 6th, 1998, in accordance with her wishes, Kevin Fitch was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. He will never get out of prison. Kevin Fitch is currently serving his sentence at the Mule Creek State Prison. His appeal has been summarily denied. Today, Patty Gray keeps her daughter's memory alive with the Kristen Gray Scholarship Fund, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping needy students pay for school expenses.